How'd you guys like Gauss's Law? Not so much? It's not as bad as you think. You just gotta kinda understand a couple key things. Um, so I wanna identify first what's called electric flux. Before we get proper into Gauss's Law, an electric flux just says if you've got some surface, let's try and make this a little more three-dimensional here. So, and you have electric field lines passing through that surface. So the electric flux is some measure of the electric field lines passing through there. The greater the concentration of field lines passing through it, the greater the electric flux. Cool? So that's kind of what flux is related to. So let's say I have a sphere here. And let's say right over here I have this positive little test charge. So in this case, we like to think of when electric field lines exit a closed volume. So now we're dealing with a closed volume instead of just a single surface here. But when field lines exit a closed volume, that's positive flux. And when they enter a closed volume, that's negative flux. So in this case, where are electric field lines coming off this positive charge? Radially outward everywhere, right? And some of them are going to enter this lovely surface. But the ones that enter this surface are also going to what? Exit the surface. And so in this case, is there any that are going to enter the surface that are going to not exit the surface? No. And so in this case, all the ones that enter the surface, that's negative flux, and all the ones that exit the surface, that's positive flux, but they all balance. And so if there's no charge enclosed in the surface, there's no electric, net electric flux going through that surface as well. And so what you find is electric flux has this lovely symbol here. And the only way you get a net electric flux is if you have a net charge inside a closed volume. And what if that net charge is? Divide it by epsilon naught, which is the permittivity of free space. Cool, another constant. Cool. But we can see that, yeah, if there is no charge inside, there shouldn't be any net flux. And so if there is a charge inside, though, there is a net flux. Cool. So this is one way of finding the flux. The other way, though, is knowing something about that surface. If you know, so the magnitude of the electric field right at that surface, if you know the area of the surface itself that's experiencing that electric field, and if you know if it's perpendicular or not. Notice, in this case, if, if this is a perfectly horizontal surface and these field lines are perpendicular to it, then in this case, cosine theta, it's theta is not here the angle between the surface and the electric field lines, it's the angle between your electric field lines and the normal, the perpendicular of the surface. So in this case, these are perpendicular to that surface, so what's the angle of the electric field relative to the normal of the horizontal? zero. And what's the cosine of zero? One, and that goes away. So if you're already perpendicular, the field lines are already perpendicular to the surface, this term goes away because cosine of zero is one. Cool. But that angle, key to remembering here is it's not the angle between the field lines and the surface, it's the angle between the field lines and the normal to the surface. How far are they from being 90 degrees from the surface? That's the key. Cool. So if you look here then, these are both ways of getting the flux. So, and depending on the situation, you might use one or the other, but you could also use such a situation maybe if you knew multiple things here to calculate the value of the electric field and things of this sort. So let's look at some examples of Gauss's law and how this might apply, but this way of calculating the flux either way or setting these equal to each other, that's Gauss's law, mathematically expressed. Okay, question number eight gives you this lovely diagram. So, I'm sorry, question number seven gives you this lovely diagram. It says, what are the electric fluxes through the spheres labeled A and B? And so in this case, the only thing you got to know is what charge ultimately resides in a certain sphere. And you can quickly get the flux right here. So in this case, if I wanted to figure out the flux, the electric flux for sphere A, what's my lovely formula? Cool. And in this case, I know how much Q is contained in that sphere. So 2 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. Plug in the permittivity of free space. And 
And so what's my flux in the sphere labeled A? Times 10 to the 2. Cool. And what are the units on that? Newton meter squared per coulomb. We divide by these units, the Newton meters come up, Newton meter squared come on top, but one of the coulombs are going to cancel, so you're only left with one coulomb. Cool. And if we wrote this not in scientific notation, what would this come out to be? Yeah, 227 Newton meters squared per coulomb. Great. And is that positive or negative? I made it positive here. Did I do that right? So in this case, are the field lines entering or exiting? Exiting. Great, so it's positive. Great. What about for the sphere labeled B? What would the electric flux for him be? Well, again, the only thing that really matters is what's total charge inside that sphere. And what is the total charge inside that sphere? Yeah, 3.0 nanocoulombs total. I did that backwards. Three point three eight nine times ten to the negative one. That, oh, you know why that's off? Because you did what I wrote. What did I do wrong here, guys? Awesome. Cool. So if you're simply wanting flux, and you can just see what total charge is enclosed in a certain surface, and that's all you need. So a lot of students are like, don't know when to use this versus this. Well, just look at what you have. If all you know is the charges, then by all means, go this route. All right, so for number eight, we have the same diagram we had before. We got a four Newton Coulomb charge at the center inside a hollow sphere that has a total of seven nanocoulombs of charge. And we're going to construct two different Gaussian surfaces. We're going to construct one right here at a distance 0 0.0010 meters from the center. And then another one will envision a Gaussian surface, spherical surface at 0 0.0025 meters from the center outside of both the solid and hollow spheres. And we just want to know what is the electric field at these radiuses this time. And so in this case, what am I actually asking you to solve for? Yeah, E. And so in this case, we know that our electric flux equals Q over epsilon naught, or our electric flux equals Ea cosine theta. And in this case, we're going to need to set them equal to each other. <coughs> cool. So in this case, we start with the 0 0.0010 meters here. So in this case, how much charge does it contain? Four nanocoulombs. Good, four nanocoulombs. So in this case, if I rearrange this real quick, what's E going to equal if you just rearrange the entire equation? Cool. And so in this case, our total Q at that radius or at that distance, same diff is 4 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. Great. Primitivity free space. So what's the area of my spherical surface here? 4 pi r squared. Oh, we're asked for both. I'm going to do this one first, and then we're going to go do this one as well. So two separate calculations. Cool. And in this case, cosine theta. So in this case, all the field lines are coming off this point charge. 
And at every single location outside the sphere, because they're concentric here, what is going to be the angle between the electric field and the surface? Zero. 90. Oh, 90. Yeah, they're already going to be orthogonal. They're going to be normal already. And so the angle between the normal, though, is zero. And so in this case, the cosine theta term is just going to go away. Cosine of zero is one. Why is it zero again? So if you look at the field lines coming off this guy, every field line is going to be perfectly perpendicular to the surface already. Cool. So if you notice where it crosses the red sphere, that's 90 degrees. That's already 90 oh, degrees. Sorry. That's 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees. Everywhere it's going to cross is going to be 90 degrees already. Cool. And so in this case, cosine of zero, because they're already exactly normal, is one. Great. Can somebody get me an electric field strength here? Cool. What if we did that for the large spherical surface at a radius of 0 0.0025 meters? How would that change things? So it's the sum of both the Good. It contains all the charge, so the sum of both. And again, the cosine theta here is also going to disappear. So cosine of zero is still one. And so our total charge here is now what? Yeah, I'm going to do 11 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. It's not proper, but sweet. And then epsilon naught. And what about our area? Somebody want to get me a value for that? I got 1.58 times 10 to the 7. Sweet. So I want to point out one thing to you here. So going back to this lovely expression right here. So we turned this into the electric field equals Q over epsilon naught times four pi r squared. Look at that guy right there. So it turns out that your lovely K, which is equal to what again in this chapter? What was the numerical value of K? 8.99 times 10 to the ninth is equal to one over four pi epsilon naught. And so if you take four pi epsilon naught, one over already, if you look, that's going to leave us with kq over r squared, something we already saw for the strength of the electric field. We're deriving it again, seeing it once again, using Gauss's law instead. Same exact equation we had earlier. Cool. So simple relation between k and epsilon naught.